He's, he's shaved. Good since afternoon, I saw him. everybody. Okay. Thanks for uh, oh, coming in from hi. lunch. Oh, sorry, Ted. <laughs> sorry. I'm Rick Feldman, um, the president of Nappy, and I'm really proud and, and honored to have yes. uh, Jeff and Ted here. Um, I want to remind all of you that there is um, a consent decree that is um, in force. And so the guy said, look, ask us anything. We'll answer anything. But if there's something that we can't answer, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, in about 10 minutes or so after we start co having a conversation, if there's something that you would like to know, or there's something you'd like to challenge, or you have a question you'd like to ask, please come up to the microphone. And in a sort of normal break um, in the conversation, I'll be glad to bring you in. Um, but what's interesting about what these guys are doing is that it's been about a year. It's, I think it's a year for Ted and almost a year for Jeff. Same. In terms of um, their new responsibilities. And we wanted to kind of take a look Time at change. where, <laughs> what they were thinking about after the first year. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to ask a question because y you guys both have had experiences at, mm, I want to paraphrase this right, more than one company over time. And so you have gotten used to, to various uh, corporate cultures. And I was worried, I was, I was interested about how you feel the various corporate cultures through your time influenced you, and then what you're sort of thinking about the NBC Comcast coupling and how difficult or easy that's been in terms of the corporate culture and its effect on both you and, and the employees. So why don't we start with... Do you want to uh, defer to the second half, or do you want to take the ball first? <laughs> well, we could both do 20 minutes on that, so let's try to keep, <laughs> keep the folks awake. All right, so my, my, I was at Disney, and then I was at News Corp, and now I'm at Comcast NBC Universal. Um, Disney, when I was there, was... All three, by the way, were rocking and rolling when I was there, so I had very good, very good luck. When I was at Disney, though, I think Disney is... I, I would describe it a bit like the IBM of the, of the entertainment business, very corporate, lots of analysis, lots of thinking before decisions were made. Then I went to News Corp, which in the early 90s was the exact opposite. It was total Wild West. It was, you know, go, go get there and do something. I would describe Comcast to me as being somewhere in the middle, right? We, we are clearly, you know, we clearly have people who run our company who will make big bets and have throughout the history of the company as they've grown it dramatically. Uh, but they're very financially motivated, very methodical, and we'll do a lot of uh, analysis before the deal gets done um, in a sometimes frustrating way, but, but in a good way. And so I, I kind of feel like I'm somewhere in the middle between my career of the, of the polls that I've been in um, and feels very comfortable. I think the other thing that's unique about Comcast is that, you know, and I, I, I've always thought this, that it's run by good people. So the whole worry that you're going to wake up in the paper and see something about your company in an un, un you know, in a bad light or somebody did something wrong or whatever. I think it's good people who, at the, at the utmost, since the day I walked into the place, told me, do the right thing, always do the right thing, um, and, then, and then do the most profitable thing second. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of a refreshing place to be. Ted? Did you notice these, these ropes here that stop people from launching up the stairs <laughs> to come get the, we need security? I noticed um, that the tie that's in the picture I yeah, threw could, away in well, 2004. If, if, if we could lose the picture of me looking at myself, which will make me faint, I'd be very grateful. Uh, the, Jeff said the right thing. To me, the whole study is good people, bad people, and I'll try not to uh, mention the bad people's names. Uh, yet my career coincidentally started to move when, I, when, when Cap Cities bought ABC, and I found myself working for Tom Murphy and Dan Burke, uh, which was just fantastic. These were just amazing people. This is not a comment on the previous management, Leonard Goldenson management. I was just more of a grunt then. But as I got to have some positions of some responsibility, then just learning from Tom and Dan uh, ab about management, about honesty, about how to treat people, how to motivate people was just extraordinary. Um, Disney buys ABC. The, the, the situation was different. Um, and, the re and I've made up with Michael Eisner, not with Michael Ovitz, but I've made up with Michael Eisner about his management style, which was he was the guy. And, and, and the rest of us, even though we had good positions of authority, he just wasn't all that interested in, in our point of view. And he, he was thrilled to be back in the television business um, after leaving it in 1977, really. Um, so he, he was back in charge of ABC, and he just loved it. And it just, uh, I didn't flourish under that because I like to be given some responsibility. Um, here, here's your number, go make it, but it's your business to go run. I did pretty well under that, and I didn't do well under the different system. Um, at Comcast, luckily I've 
the guy that gets to work for two Burks in my career, and it's really the same thing. Go run your business, don't screw it up, uh, but you've got some decision-making authority. And it, I have only one rule left, which is, are they good, kind, good, decent, not always kind, but are they good, decent people? who you know you're going to get a straight story from. Um, I just can't work for the anybody else. Life's too short. Life's too short, and I'm too old. OK, that's good. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the international world. When you took the job about a year ago, you were sort of, um, I don't want to say stuck, because a lot of people love Philadelphia, but you were down in Philadelphia. And now you're in London, which is pretty exciting. And I wanted to know. The cities are very similar. <laughs> in, <laughs> Philly steak sandwich in both places. <laughs> so I know you've also uh, made um, a lot of changes since you've been there for the last year. And I think that it was a relatively siloed place, which I think that you've broken down a little bit. And I was wondering what was, I know it takes time to analyze where you think the place is before you make your changes, but I was wondering what your mindset was in terms of when you went in, maybe some of the surprises, um, what you found that maybe you thought was surprising good, surprising bad, and then what motivated you to make some of the changes you made. Yeah, so um, the first thing that I learned within my first week on the job was this whole concept of international is ridiculous. And for those of you, most of you probably work in the international business, there is no international business. It's, it's this, a term that America makes up to say it's us and then the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is like 90 or 100 different you know, countries that have any meaningful scale, all of which have completely different markets, completely different histories, completely different tastes, lots of different languages, and take as much time and are as complicated as the United States, except that when you do a deal, it happens to be hundreds of thousands of dollars as opposed to hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, the second thing that I learned is that the stupidest media companies are companies that take you know, a white guy that doesn't speak any language for me but, but English and barely speaks English and takes him and says, okay, you're in charge of international. Good luck. So, um, no, I, you know, I, I, think that, I think that the nice thing for me, the thing that I have going for me to try to overcome that, that stupidness of me and my company is that my job right now is very similar to my job was seven years ago when I joined TED at Comcast, which was I joined Comcast. We had a, a, a lot of wonderful programming assets, but we ran them as individual assets and didn't really run them as a business. And so Ted and I together kind of set out to run, run those things as businesses and, 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 and put them all together and run them sensibly. Um, and uh, while we did that, we helped our bosses try to figure out how to get way bigger in the content business. So fast forward to my job now, we have a bunch of international businesses. My job is, without Ted, unfortunately, over there, is to try to run them sensibly as a series of businesses as opposed to just investments. And it's really astounding when you go from country to country where your head of sales hasn't even met your head of networks and your guy that, you know, gal that runs home entertainment doesn't even know who, you know, who the theatrical person is. And we're trying to pull all this together and run them really as integrated businesses, um, which seems kind of elementary. And I think the people in the territories actually want that, but it's, it's not the way our industry grew up where we're really international distribution outlets for various domestic businesses. And then the second part of my job is like when I got to Comcast is figure out while we try to run the business sensibly, try to figure out how we get way bigger internationally because only 8% of our revenue comes from international outside the U.S. And uh, if you just do math and the U.S. is growing 1% and India is growing 15% and Brazil is growing 9%, we will die versus our competitors eventually if we maintain that 92-8 split. So we have to get bigger outside the United States. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sound. Uh, that sounded perfect, and you should. Uh, you traded me for Kevin McClellan, and you did way. You got way better off than with Kevin McClellan, who's it was a good trade thousand times yeah. smarter than I am. Um, <laughs> I had how, Kevin and you though before. That's true. That's that's not bad. How often do your uh, business interests? I know that you're you're friends, but how often do you talk to each other, like in an average week or two, about business that affects both of you, or does that not happen? Ninety-two often? eight. Um, <laughs> I'm usually on the phone for Steve Burke's staff meetings, right. and Ted's usually there, so I usually email him and said, when that person said that, what was their facial expression? Right. So. We email a, a, a thousand times a week, and, and you know, a little bit of business, but, but he's also, you know, we're lucky that, that being on Steve Burke's executive committee, we have, we're supposed to help run the company, so we talk a lot, about, a lot of things about the company. Well, it's interesting because um, Ted and I, if you look at the people that Steve Burke has reporting to him, I believe we're the only two people that have ever reported to him before. That would be correct. So it gives us kind of an interesting, we, we know the guy that we're working for, so we can kind of um, 
It's just a different Not position. always an advantage, but we do. I don't know. <laughs> you think it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the um, domestic uh, TV station business in the U.S. Sure. Um, obviously, NBC TV stations over time uh, were having some problems. Valerie's there now. You're there now. And um, what was your mindset when you went in? And, and you know, when you, when you saw where the stations were, it was it, and did it seem worse or better than you thought it was when you came back to take them over? Mm. Um, I don't think it was a fantastic situation when I got there, um, not because of the people in the jobs, smart, well-intentioned people. It was really a, um, it's just so interesting that what I look at over the last year is let's all go study the same problem and how good, well-meaning management can come up with a totally different point of view than what our point of view is. It's just different. It's, it's a, there are people that say the television station business isn't a good business. Well, a lot of people are making a lot of money off it. You just have to do it right, and you have to be number one or number two in your news time periods, and then you can do very, very well for yourself. So there were just far few time periods uh, that we were doing well in, and that was because the, the company took away the investment in those stations. There just weren't enough people, there weren't enough trucks, there weren't enough helicopters. And so um, I did a lot of studying, realized that, that boy, did I need some, some help be, with someone who knows it much more directly than I do, and was lucky enough to find Valerie Staub, who I think is one of the, my best hires in my entire career, and that's a lot of people. So what we did together is go uh, take... Uh, well over $20 million and reinvested back into the stations, hired 130 people, bought a helicopter for New York and L.A., bought a lot of trucks. We had trucks all over this country with 300,000 miles on them, not enough reporters, not enough, not enough anything. So the good news is when you're just going to say... How do viewers see the difference in that? Oh, you can, you can just tell. It's about how much news is on the air, and actually Valerie's helped me with this, is, is what's in the newscast? What, what enterprise journalism is going on? Are you out there covering? So just a, a, an example I find sort of amusing, but it's tragic, is that a few years ago there was a big fire out in Queens, uh, and they couldn't get the trucks out to the, our, our news vans out to the fire because we were saving money by having them parked in New Jersey so we wouldn't have to pay the New York parking fees. Really? So, so that's just over. That's just plain over. So you say, we're going to win, we're going to go cover the news, and we, we have results. We have, we have Channel 4 in New York now is number one from 5 to 7. In November of 2011, it was the number one revenue generating station in the market. You can do it. Now, we have further to go in some stations. Some stations like WRC uh, Washington is already number one in most of its time period. So it's, it's certainly, we've got a lot of smart people doing great work. We just had to give them some stuff. And you can, you can see it on the air. What you can really see is when something uh, difficult happens, like Hurricane Irene, and you see this company come together, and you see local work with network with, and with the Weather Channel, and we just blew them out. We, we won that day. We won that Saturday because we were on the air the whole time, and other people weren't. Brian Williams came down to anchor an hour of Channel 4 in New York. It was just so cool. And, and, and Steve Burke, in, in his uh, remarks at our offsite in beautiful Orlando a few days ago, pointed out eight things that he think worked in, two, in 2011. And one was uh, local stations and the investment and things like Hurricane Irene. That we all sat there and said, wow, look at what this joint can do if we all work together and everybody gets each other on the phone. And you know the boss on top is saying, you all work together, you're going home. And it just kind of wasn't that way before. Now, I know staying with the stations for, for a bit, obviously, a lot of their important inventory is in prime time. Prime mm -hmm. time is obviously the, the um, responsibility of uh, Bob, and, and Smash is um, a, a big show for you coming up. But I was wondering, because we, we, I haven't followed up with you, we had a conversation over the summer in your office, and we were talking about the fall season, and I mentioned to you that you guys were launching a lot of shows in a short period of time. And I was wondering if now that you've been through, you've seen the fall and you've seen the experience, do, do you think looking ahead, um, networks will st start, I mean, a couple of years ago, there was so much talk about trying to do the whole development season differently so that there would just not be 10 or 15 or 12 shows you know, premiering in three weeks. Mm -hmm. And w regardless of what you think about the shows that made it or didn't make it, it would seem that if you could concentrate on a couple of shows at, at, at time, do you think over time, and Smash is obviously getting a lot of attention coming up, but do you think that because of how difficult the fall was that people will start looking more and more and trying to figure out a way to launch new shows at different times? No. No. 
No, I'm, 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 no let me tell you the truth. I, I've been trying to answer that question since 1938 when I, when I started with <laughs> Marconi working on the tube. It's just, that, that, it, it, it's a good question, but it's not the point anymore. Because the answer is yes, we're doing stuff all the time. We're premiering shows all the time, picking up shows all the time. The, the issue is, and what, the, to answer your previous question about was it worse or better, I thought I understood, and I have a, I have a way in to, to help with, with Bob because I've worked with ad sales and worked with research, and I was a scheduler for a long time. So I've talked to him a lot about that. And, and boy, do we not really have a circulation base right now that even if you put on a, a good show, and I, 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 I may not know much about what's the right big hit show, but Prime Suspect wasn't as bad a show as a one rating. And The Firm is better, a better show than this rating. So we just have an issue in, in getting people uh, to, to, to know that a show's on, no matter, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of promos for, on NBC for Smash, but I bet everybody who lives in the U.S. and watches is a television person probably watches more NBC than most. We still don't have, frankly, the awareness that I want that show to have before we go on uh, the night after the Super Bowl. So here's the good news. We've got this big company in Comcast and a lot of ability in what we call Project Symphony to go spread the word. So it's not just promos, and it's not just spending a lot of money on off-channel, which we will, but it's, it's getting on that Barker on E. It's getting, on, getting promos on Bravo, getting promos on USA. All, all over the Comcast systems, getting the, the, the word out there. So we're just going to go crazy on Smash, and that's really going to start in, in the next couple of weeks. I mean, starting right now for Go Heavy until premiere. And you just have to really, it's amazing. We had a movie that came out from Universal early in the year called Hop. And so we, had this, we turned hop into a verb, let's hop it. And the company went wild. And I know we made, we know we made $10 million more this, that weekend than we would have. We did the same thing with The Voice, we're gonna do the same thing with Smash. We can really get the word out now, and we just have to, because our own, the structure of our schedule is such that we're not there really able to, to uh, get new shows launched properly. Okay, um, if anybody's got a question, please come on up to the mic and um, I'll start bringing Don't you storm into, the, the stage. into the conversation. What? Please um, be respectful of the rules. So let's talk about international for a second and in terms of uh, those growth areas, um, both, you know, that, that seem to be growing really quickly and others that you just, you see are under the bubble and, and they're going to pop up. And when you're looking at opportunity over the world, what you're seeing and also what you're thinking in terms of maybe new fertile areas for, for formats, you know, and how many people you have all over the world, like kind of looking for that um, needle in the haystack. Yeah. Well, we have, you know, Kevin McClellan, who, who moved over to London, that Ted let me, let me steal and fortunately came to kind of do all the work in international. He runs really the core of our business, which is television. And that, that really consists of selling our, our shows and our films to broadcast networks outside of the United States. Um, distributing our networks, just a quick aside on that. It's kind of the same business. I'm, I'm surprised that people don't look at it that way when you think about do you go launch a universal channel or do you go sell house to a broadcaster? Well, you can kind of make the decision, do you sell house to yourself at, for the right price and then go sell a network to a distributor or do you sell it to a broadcaster? It's all the same economics, you know, economic analysis. So we've kind of put those together and, and that represents a growth area because we can kind of look at each, each territory and decide where do we want to make our bets? You know, like take a place like Germany, um, where pay television penetration in Germany is about 20%. People all have analog cable. They plug in their TVs like we used to do you know, back in the 80s in the United States. They get a bunch of channels. It's part of their rent or part of their mortgage. They never see a bill for it. If they want to pay extra and get a satellite or, or pay television, 20% of people do that. Well, the reality is that that's going to grow in Germany, or at least that's our bet that it's going to grow. And it's going to grow because people want DVRs and they want HD and all the things that are driving triple play in the United States, we believe will grow pay penetration in Germany. So therefore, if you believe that's true, you actually want to be more on the network side than on the sales side. You want to launch new networks so as penetration grows, you can be first and take advantage of that mm -hmm. and get the advertising. So we're, we can, by being both on both sides of it and putting it together and, and having our team in in Germany, who represents both sides, really maximize our revenue. The other area that's a big growth area for us is, and you kind of alluded to it, Rick, the world is becoming much more localized. It used to be you could just roll out a great show from the United States, sell it all over the world, make a ton of money. You still can for the best shows, but increasingly, country by country by country, things are becoming much more local, and the tastes are not just American shows, they're local shows or shows from other places. 
So we have a kind of quietly, you know, one of the assets I didn't even realize until I went over there is we have a great production business that Kevin oversees with a number of different labels that produce a wide variety of programming outside of the United States, like Downton Abbey, which is our show, um, which we unfortunately sold to PBS before we got here, but uh, it's a great show. We have a show called uh, The Slap in Australia, which is the number one show in Australia. Um, so shows are not just going to come from the United States anymore. They're going to come from everywhere and all over the world. Creative people are everywhere. And as, as programming gets more local in each territory, there's going to be great ideas, whether they're a show that actually travels or, incre or increasingly a format where you say, I love this story, I love this show, but the way it's shot and with the people it's shot with it won't work in the United States. Let's go talk to, to Bob and Ted and see if we can't uh, produce it for the United States audience. So I think that's a big growth area for the company as things get more local. And one thing I want to add to that, yes, we must do that, but to your other question about when do we do what we do, what I really care about is the innovative ideas like Mr. Feldheimer's with, with the Charlie Sheen show, the anger management show. No idea if that show's going to work or not, but the model is fantastic. The model is fantastic. The model we have with John Moyanis and E1 on the firm is fantastic. These are smart people coming up using the international model to find a way to, to for us to get yeah. things made, pick the, get yeah. things made, and pick up shows so we don't stay in the exact same formula of every drama is 3.2 million dollars and every single camera com comedy is 2.2 million dollars, and it's just a really difficult system. We've got to have a way to offset some of these costs and uh, come up with a smarter way to schedule. Now, what did I miss? Why was it unfortunate to sell Downton Abbey to PBS, which would seem like a good poem for it? Well, actually, it was, it, I, I was just joking that it's a great show that you'd love to have maybe on NBC. I mean, who knows if it would have worked on NBC as the same as, as PBS. Because it, se it just seems to fit, you know, obviously. With, uh, it it and, does. And, and, doing, and it's doing well. And in fairness, without Rebecca Eaton and, and, and the folks at PBS, the show may not have been as good. I mean, they were very instrumental all the way along. So it's been a great partnership, and we're happy to have it on PBS. I'm just saying good shows won't just come from the U.S. anymore. They're going to come from I think we have a place. question. We do. Hi, how are you doing? My good. name is Donna Briggs. And I'm, thanks so much for taking my question. I currently have three radio shows, um, one on CBS, one on Radio 1, and one on the Internet, and two TV shows. One... Boy, you're busy. Yes. Um, both of them I produce, edit, and I host. What advice would you give someone like me who's doing it already, already have shows in the can, as they say, and what advice would you give for someone like that? What's your goal? Um, distribution. To be seen um, worldwide. Bunch of bunch of folks in the building here that do that for a living. Well, I know that, but what <laughs> advice would you give to someone who actually has engine. a product? A, a lot of people have dreams, but they don't have anything. I actually have a product. You have shows that you can show, go show people and go yes, march into that. their booth and say, "Look at this. You ought to dis distribute this." I yes. do. And let me I'm let me jump in too. Let me jump in too. So um, that, you prob probably know that, but um, we we launched when I when we were together at Comcast, we partnered with Radio One to launch a, a very successful network called TV One, which we still at Comcast right. own a big chunk of. And the whole concept was we didn't believe the radio business was dead, and felt that it was a very interesting proposition to have successful radio uh, personalities who would then promote and cross over onto television. And TV One's been phenomenally successful for, mm -hmm. for Comcast and for Radio One. So I kind of think you're halfway there already. You've got, a, you know, you've got a good start. And the question is, as Ted said, use that distribution to broaden yourself out with the people here. So Ted, what is it about Ryan Seacrest that he can have 55 jobs, including a rumored job in, in the morning on NBC, and, and we have 13 million people in the country who don't have one? I, I, don't, I think it just kind of explains itself. He's amongst the best at what he does of anyone I've ever seen. Um, here's, the, here's the proof. And it's not, everyone knows he works hard and he wants to do a lot of stuff and he's all over the place. If you go look at ABC on New Year's Eve at around 10 to 12, when it's really getting hot and heavy, and he's walking, he's not just on his platform, but he's walking on the street and he's, and I, it's amazing. He's got a million people around him screaming. He's got so much going on in his ear screaming, and he's just letter perfect. He just, he's slow and calm and fun and, and, the, and just 
can do it. And uh, he's not the only one. Matt Lauer does it. Brian Gumbel does it. Uh, there's plenty of guys that have, that have can, the red light goes on and they just don't screw it up. And there's, I, there's just a, in, in history of broadcasting, there's a, in television, a few people that can do that. And most of the time, radio guys can't transfer, don't transfer to television. Uh, he, he really is just a, he's a genuine guy, and so the reason he's so popular is that people just know that that's who he is. And I do spend some time with him, and that's who he is. And I, I don't think it does, needs or deserves much, much more explanation than that. Uh, I'm hoping that we can keep him at our company, because he's a really, really uh, tremendous talent. Can I jump in on that, too? Sure. My, so my wife, Laura, has a theory, which Ted has heard before, <laughs> that all these people, we say, how can you just be famous for being famous, whether it's a Kim Kardashian or whatever? That, that you don't get to the level that some of these people are without being a little bit smarter than people think you are. And that, you know, and that Ryan, to me, I mean, Ted kind of put the hand on it, but Ryan, he, he I mean, you, you glossed over it working hard. He works harder than anybody. He works harder than any executive I've ever met. The guy is always working. And so he combines a unique talent with hard work with mm -hmm. a little bit of luck. And you need a little bit of luck in this business mm -hmm. to, to do that. And if you can get all three, um, you can really be successful. And I, I agree with my wife. I think a lot, of, a lot of these people who have gotten to that level of success, it takes a little bit more brain power than, than the world sometimes gives you credit for. I think the, uh, most one of the most interesting things I study, because all I really do is study what people do and why they do it, is the, this generational and societal shift we have of, of rewarding and embracing people that don't bring a, a obvious talent um, to the table and, and for whatever reason of recognizing that in Kardashians and others, um, there is obviously both a business and an, and an appetite out there for that and I think uh, old white guys like us have to recognize that. Yes, sir? How do you get a show like Community to get to the point where it's got at least 90 episodes so that it's got greater shelf value down the years? That's a great question. How do you get a show like, see that, you actually asked the question in a very interesting way, um, because I think we, we, we've sure tried. Uh, again, another great study of, you know, the, Brandon Tartikoff said famously, every show should be someone's favorite show. Community is obviously some, a lot of people's favorite shows, but, but what is it about the show that, that keeps it around the, you know, four and a half to five million people a week when it's been on for quite a while and people have had the opportunity. Now, is that, the, the answer may be, just shut up, Ted, that's your business now. Be happy you've got those four million people. You could go put on a show and get two million people. You've shown a great ability to do that as well. So, so, so <laughs> why don't you just stick while the sticking is good? Um, that's something we've got to figure out, right? Because normally, for that, um, again, we're, we're talking about the, the model. You're going to spend that much money on a show. You'd, you'd like to be up there in the, around a three rating, wouldn't you? So the real answer to your question is, I don't know how to, how to make it more people watch. Um, so many, many have watched and said, that's my show. But frankly, many more have said, no, it's not. So uh, talk to you in May. Well, just to follow up, then why not put a show like that on the NBC network groups, the, uh, some of the, the niche networks that you have, just to get through an additional year? Uh, in that particular uh, example, that's, that's Sony's decision. So, Sony owns that show, so we don't have rights to do that. But you've now happened on another good thing to study is that's certainly what the uh, cable network would do is here's a show, let's go put it all over the place. Uh, we're talking about that a lot. Look, we've got Smash going on the air in a couple of weeks, and starting last week, we've now got it out on VOD, we've got it on iTunes. We're letting the pilot out for the world to see before it's on the linear network. Hoping that that's a really good idea. We're pretty sure it's a good idea. It worked wonderfully for the Fox Network with New Girl this year, and they didn't think they had the right awareness, and so they put it out there, and more people came to the linear network. Uh, we're, we're really interested in that model, and we're going to study this very carefully. So you're on to something there. Thank you. Next. Hi, this is uh, Francisco Rivera from Telemundo. Uh, I have a question for you uh, in regards to your international experience. I see that you guys are um, you know, adapting shows and getting a lot of learning from this deployment in universal deployment around the globe. How do you communicate back to um, the U.S. Uh, brands so that they might take some learnings from you guys internationally and apply them here since this is such a diverse uh, country. Yeah, how are you going to teach the brass, Jeff? <laughs> well, and you said you're from Telemundo? Yes. Yes. Uh, so yesterday, last night, I had dinner with Emilio Romano, who's the new, new head of Telemundo. 
Um, and we were having exactly this discussion and talking about how uh, in the novella business, is there a format business? You know, it used to be you buy a novella from somewhere, and if it's not in, you know, Spanish language, you dub it. Um, but even if you dub it, the Spanish language, there's different dialects and different uh, accents and different origins. So the, the whole concept that's kind of happened in the English language market in the U.S. where it's, you know, you're, you're selling formats and you're co-producing and doing things like that probably should spread to all of the other markets, not just Telemundo here in the United States, but across the globe. So I think, you know, first of all, you know, we have a company, I don't know how it existed before we got there, but there's a lot of discussion between the various parts of the company. I think part of my job is to tell people what's going on internationally and for me to know what's going on with their businesses. We didn't have, just like we didn't have interaction between our various international uh, subsets in each country, we didn't have a lot of communication between the international businesses and the domestic businesses. So Universal Channel, you know, which Kevin runs internationally, really is the international version of USA Network in the US, which is one of the strongest cable networks in the history of television. And yet they didn't talk, they didn't, you know, they didn't coordinate their marketing or branding or production or any of that. So I think that we have to start, tie as the world kind of spreads out and gets a lot more localized, I think we have to start tying the various pieces of our business together in a more specific way. And with Telemundo, we're certainly going to tie um, Telemundo more closely to the things we're doing in Latin America. Thank you. Thank you. So Jeff, um, on your um, bio, it says that part of your responsibilities now are theatrical distribution and international theme parks. And I was, I was wondering how that dovetails to you know, content and video. Is there some sort of a synergy there, or are they sort of separate silos? And, and what are you learning from, uh, from those that, that uh, you, you perhaps didn't know before? Well, I thought network television was a tough business. The theatrical business is a really, really, really tough business. I, I, you know, the, let, me, let me especially start with theme parks. Theme parks is easier. We at Universal, we have, um, in the United States, we have a number of theme parks that we own, you know, a couple up in Orlando and Universal Studios in, in, uh, in L.A. Internationally, we license our, our, our brand and we help manage the theme parks. We have a, a very successful theme park in Osaka in Japan and one that just opened in Singapore and we're looking at other places. It's a, first of all, our company, I think it's one of the biggest surprises in our company, we talked about this last week, that the theme park business is a really, really good business, particularly for a company like ours with lots of capital. If you're willing to invest the capital, mm -hmm. it's a great return. And if you can find things like Harry Potter, uh, which is doing phenomenal things up in Orlando, it's a, it's a, it's a great business. The other thing that's interesting that we found internationally, and Kevin and I were kind of surprised by this as we were going around to the different territories, in places where there's a universal theme park, the view of the universal brand is completely different, wow. right? So if, if you have a park, and, and then it kind of makes sense, it's one of these things that's obvious, but until you kind of see it, you don't get there. But you go to Singapore, and you see a number of different advertisements for the new Singapore Universal Studios, and suddenly, when you talk about the Universal Channel, people kind of get it. Ah, Universal Studios, that's the Hollywood theme park. Universal Channel, that's the Hollywood Channel. I get it. Whereas if you're in countries that don't have a theme park, um, you don't really have kind of that same marketing uh, power. You go to Brazil, by the way, which Brazil is the, the number one um, kind of uh, place that people go to Universal Studios from outside the United States and Orlando come to, or Brazilians, right? So a lot of advertising for Universal Studios in Brazil. And as a result, in Brazil, our Universal Channel is incredibly strong. People know it. They know what to get. They get it. So the theme park business kind of feels like it's separate. But when you start thinking about the ties of brands together, it's a very, very uh, synergistic business. And we have the opportunity around the globe to look for places where we can do different kinds of theme parks to drive our brand. Um, so that's a good business. The theatrical business is a little bit different. I, I personally think I, everything I know about the theatrical business I've learned in the last year um, and I've learned enough to know that I don't know anything about it. You know, I, I, I'll look at a movie and say, this movie stinks, and it'll just be on fire. And then I'll see another movie that I think is great, and it'll be a total bomb. So I, I know nothing about picking good movies. What I do know, though, is that when you get past that first window, when you get past the movie going into the theaters and doing that first window, the world is completely converging. So, you know, so Netflix sits across the table at you and says... I want your films and I want your TV and I want them cross-platform, I want to stream them and I want to sell DVDs. Well, you can't say to them, okay, well, let's spend the first 10 minutes of this meeting talking to this guy because he's in charge of home entertainment and spend the second 10 minutes of the meeting talking to this gal because she's in part of television distribution. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of, you know, Netflix and companies like that have adapted their business to what consumers want. We have to adapt our business 
to, uh, to what our customers want, which is both consumers and business to business. So the reality is the theme park business is, I mean, the, the theatrical business is no different. And I actually have a theory, which is not elementary. I think you look at all these different, you know, kind of ways that DVCs get sold. You know, first there was a rental. Okay, so you rent a movie, right? Then somebody came up with the bright idea, let's sell it. Well, that, all that is is renting it forever. It's just saying, you're going to come back and rent this. Just pay us a couple more bucks, and you can rent it forever. And then somebody came up with a bright idea, well, just pay us per month, and you can have that movie and a lot of other movies. Well, that's just renting stuff per month in a bundle. And so these are all continuums of the same thing. And unless you kind of look at them in tandem by market, you can't maximize your economics and maximize what consumers want. And, eventually, and essentially, whether it's Ted's business or my business globally or other businesses, we're in the business of trying to figure out what consumers want and price it fairly and get it to them. Mm -hmm. And unless you look at these businesses in a consolidated way, you really can't do that. Smarty pants. Does that sound good? Fantastic. I, I, I said it almost the way you wrote it. I just changed the end a little bit. Very impressive. Yeah. Uh, probably the last question, Ted. Um, looking at the uh, domestic market, syndication market, daytime market, mm -hmm. it's, there's going to be a bunch of newbies uh, next year. We have mm -hmm. Katie, and we have Jeff, and we have Steve Harvey, and we have Ricky. So I wanted to just get your objective take on that environment, and, and uh, why Steve, and what you're thinking about the other guys. <laughs> I, like the, I, like, I like Ben's uh, uh, headline, the talk soup, which you get a royalty to Eve on that, um, because I, I guess, yeah, it is talk soup. I, I can obviously speak more for our company than for anybody else, um, and we're thrilled to have uh, Steve Harvey and both Jeff and Jeff Probst on the NBC-owned stations. He, to us, it's a, uh, when Steve Burke was putting up his, his six things that worked, um, interestingly put up own television stations, but also had a separate slot for Steve Harvey because it was such an interesting. Ted keeps mentioning that there were no international things no, up on the air. No, there was something good. <laughs> like the answer you just gave. Um, the no, but imagine you know, Katie Kirk is, is was part of the family for a long time, and still that real feeling. And, and boy, did we go down that path and and did so willingly and. and when it first became available, we thought, okay, we're going to end up being the, the Katie Couric guys. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. The previous management had decided, didn't like the daytime business very much, didn't, didn't do much. The, our last foray into it um, was repeats of Housewives of Atlanta and Beverly Hills, which is a really different way of looking at the business. And the business was looked at, um, we have very talented people in that division, but we had management saying, yeah, don't, don't, don't really do anything. Just, just, just go put on some repeats and we won't lose any money. Didn't make any money either. So our, our hopefully not silly people, said, no, let's go compete. Let's go get out there. So, but we want to do it reasonably. And, and we looked very carefully at the economics of a Katie Couric deal and, and what was in it for her and what was in it for us. And in the end, um, ABC made the decision they made. We made the decision we made. We think Steve Harvey is, every show needs a point of distinction, in my view. There's plenty of talk out there. Um, and it's been there for a long time. Um, Ellen does a fantastic job of doing a, an entertaining talk show. Dr. Phil does a fantastic job of doing a hard advice show. I'm going to get in there and tell you how to, how to uh, um, fix your life. We've got a guy who can do both. He can be really funny about it, but then since he's got three New York Times bestsellers and he's been on the radio for 25 years dispensing advice every morning, it's going to become a, a, a substantive advice show. So that just appealed to me in a great way. And Jeff Probst came into my office and I just thought, and I watched his pilot that CBS did a great job with, and said, wow, this guy can interview. This guy really cares. This guy can talk. He can dig into it. So uh, the, only, the only point is, and I think our, our competitors are doing the same thing, is it's, as someone said, a fancy statement, Oprah latency, I think uh, Mark Marcus said, um, we've, we're going to replace the, all those rating points uh, because Oprah's gone. So sure, is there a big competition? Will everybody win? No. Um, but I, A, like our hand, and B, what I really like is we're out there doing something. We're going to go take a stab. Uh, when I got to the building, there was someone there that isn't there now who said, why are you guys doing this? Why are you guys putting all this money in the stations? Why are you putting money? We've tried that. It doesn't work. Those shows don't work. And I looked at this person and said, well, you're just telling me to go home. We should just close down the building. If, if nothing works, what are we doing here? We're here to be, to be good business people, to be programmers, and go try something. If it doesn't work, we'll go do the next thing. And maybe there's all sorts of new uh, uh, ways of doing television that I haven't 
heard about yet, but that's all I know how to do. You go ask the boss for some money, go put on the best show you can, promote the hell out of it, and uh, hope you don't have to come back and talk on a panel again. <laughs> do it again. Well, on that note, let me say thank you very much, especially for you. That's I know you uh, came a long way to go. Thank you. <laughs> 14. So thank you. Really appreciate it. And um, have a good couple of days, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, thank guys. You all. That was fun.